Hi, my name is Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote. This podcast has been brought to you by the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. To learn more, visit www.thecgo.org. Welcome back to my podcast. Today I will be speaking with John Stossel, a journalist and author known for his career on ABC and Fox Business Channel, and also Reason. Today we will be talking about consumer protection, the nanny state, and ridiculous ways that the government wastes your money. Welcome, John. Thank you. Before we jump in, I would like to ask you a question that I ask everyone that I interview. What is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't know? Um, That the news you get is largely bullshit and scaremongering. And while my profession is specialized in that, because more people are going to watch me on TV if I say, Tonight, on 2020, this is going to kill you. Then if I say things are pretty okay, uh, it's worse now for people your age because the powerful Instagram and Facebook, et cetera, algorithms feed you exactly what you already believe and what will piss you off that they know what you'll look at for a fraction of a second longer, and they just give you more of that. So the news you're getting on your feeds is what we call confirmation bias, more of what you already believe, and nastily things that may make you angry. That's very scary to think about in a way, because I don't know, it just is it kind of like you can if you think about it you can see it in everyday life if you look for it and just the fact that our world is like full of that it's kind of scary idea um let's begin with consumer protection you begin your career as a consumer protection reporter can you tell us a little bit about that I graduated college and I'm a stutterer, so I didn't want to be on the beat competing with all the other reporters where I might humiliate myself trying to ask a question. So I kind of invented TV consumer reporting and started covering other things. And at the time, the media basically covered politics, crime, natural disasters like the virus, the weather, sports, and that was about it. So that left out medicine, psychology, business, economics. And my attitude toward business was like most young leftists that uh, capitalism is okay, brings us some stuff, but it's cruel and unfair. So we need government and lawyers suing and rules to protect us from the capitalists. And I believed that for too long. What make what made you change your views? Well, after I got lots of praise for doing that kind of reporting, I, they gave me 19 Emmy awards. I stayed on the beat and saw that the rules weren't making things better, that they were just making life more complex. And the people who were cheating were still cheating because they would get away with it for a a while. And then the sleepy regulators would come after them and they would hire a sleazy lawyer to defend them and hold the regulators off for five years. And then they would just change the name of the product or sign an agreement saying we'll pay all the lawyers and we won't do it again. Um, 
but the people selling the burn fat while you sleep pills and the scams kept getting away with it. But the good companies had to hire compliance officers and all kinds of useless people waste, not useless people, people spent their days uselessly wasting time on all these rules. So what do you say to people who argue that it's necessary to protect consumers, that they don't have time to do research and look into what companies are good and reliable and which ones aren't? You don't have to worry about it because the market protects you, that you don't need people who, you just need a few people who have the time and a few people who pay attention. And through word of mouth and a free society, the good and bad news spreads. And so the good suppliers grow and the bad ones atrophy. I mean, take cars as an example. I don't know what makes one car run better than another or safer than another, but the worst car I can buy in America is better than what the Soviet Union could produce, even though it was actual rocket scientists who were building it. But that daily competition protects us because you don't survive unless your product is as good or better than the next guy's. So do these rules actually protect consumers? Rarely. So they get in the way of business, really. And invention. If you want to change a rule in government, you got to wait four years for the election or eight or if ever. And it's just safer to do what you're doing all the time, what you were doing in the past. But if you're in business, you have to be innovating every minute to stay ahead of your competitors. And that protects us much better than government ever has. Now, you need some government. The worst places to live is where there's no government, where an African country where you're afraid to build a factory because your neighbor may steal what you make or the dictator may take the whole factory. And so few people build anything. So you need government to make sure you don't, people don't kill each other or rob from each other. That if you buy a piece of property, you have a deed and that deed is honored and for pollution control rules. And that's all we need government for. But right now, it's much, much more than that. So if, in terms of protecting consumers from, like, bad products or anything, or whatever, then what is the best way to protect consumers? What is the best way to ensure that people aren't getting scammed left and right? Let competition be free. Seems to make sense. Um... Let's turn to the topic of the nanny state. People enjoy eating fast food and drinking large quantities of Coke or 7-Up, using nicotine, other drugs, things that possibly, arguably, are not the most healthy things, the most beneficial things for our living. And health professionals, along with politicians, would prefer that we wouldn't use these things, that we wouldn't do these things at all. And they use that to pass legislation and to pass laws that tell us what we can and can't do, when and where we can smoke, things like that. And effectively, we're treated like children. So that's why it's called the nanny state. Um, What do you say to people who argue that we need these rules for our safety to ensure that we're safe? Don't I own my own body? Isn't it my choice? And by that logic, of your logic, uh, where does it stop? Maybe there should be exercise police who come into our homes and make us run laps and do push-ups. My body should be my body, should be my choice. Now, if you want to nudge people and say taxes on cigarettes are higher than they are on candy because cigarettes are worse. That seems like a less harmful nudge. But I would go further than you did in your list of nanny state examples, because if we own our own body, once you're an adult, and that should be the determinant, and I don't know where that line is, uh, 
you can can go fight for your country uh, at your age, I believe. Um, can't buy liquor at that age, but different states can have different rules. But once you're whatever adult is, you ought to be able to take heroin. Take anything take heroin. you want. <laughs> so I watched this episode of your show on Fox and forgive me for not watching it live because I was like about seven years old at the time. But, but um, in the episode, you interviewed this legislator from New York and he wanted to ban fish pedicures. Um, he said that they were, quote, dirty, dangerous and mean to the fish. Do you remember what his argument why they should be banned was and why he was wrong? Barely. Um, fish, it was a TV gimmick. and Not that many people <laughs> get fish pedicures, but some entrepreneurs would put your feet in this bucket of fish and the little fish would nibble away the dead skin, sort of tickled. Uh, and he felt it was unsanitary or not licensed. There's always, if you're a legislator, you feel you're not doing your job unless you're passing new laws. No group of school kids ever went to the state capitol and asked their politicians, what laws have you repealed? And if you're one of the hundreds of thousands of regulators that are hired, you think you're not doing your job unless you're adding regulations. So the conceit is that, that they know better. And in many cases, they do. A lot of us are reckless. But that they're going to protect us by passing a rule. But the rule just makes life more complex, makes everything more expensive, and takes away our choice. Yeah, that... I mean, yeah, because... If it takes away choice, doesn't it also take away the responsibility we feel when faced with those choices? With, with, yeah, with those choices. Yeah. Um, so what do you say to people who argue that even though it infringes on our personal freedom, it still, it protects society as a whole because then that's how everyone so let's say someone's on a motorcycle right and they get in a crash then the healthcare system provided by the government pays for it and that comes from taxpayers so then society is paying for your injury for the mistake that you made for getting on that motorcycle and crashing um and that is the argument that they use and uh, if you don't want to wear a helmet, that's your business. But but it's my business because I have to pay for your health care. We who believe in freedom argue that you shouldn't have to pay for my health care. Uh, and given, okay, we have Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth, and so the public is paying for the health care, if that gives them a right to do that, then they ought to have a right to require us to eat only vegetables or no ice cream, or there's no end to where the state can intervene. And who wants to live in a world without ice cream? I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael Bloomberg, is he a nanny state guy? Yes. What is what types of things does he try to what sorts of legislation and stuff has he proposed? Uh, about 20 things. And he was proud of them. He wanted stores to hide the cigarettes so people your age couldn't see them and view them like a normal product. He wanted to ban large sodas. Uh, he does ban on his terminals certain words like that might lead to a possible sexual harassment suit. So Sleeping Beauty or Snow White or whoever it is can't, you couldn't say that she pricked her finger on a spindle because that word is banned on Bloomberg terminals. I am no, you introduced me as a Fox or and reason person. I, reason runs my videos, but 
I'm actually not connected with them anymore. I just put out a video every Tuesday, five minute video under Stossel TV. And I recently did one on Bloomberg where it was just odd watching the old video of a lot of his nanny state proposals were defeated by the legislature, but he was proud that he proposed them because he smugly wants to save us. And the irony as he's trying to ban salt is that he eats terribly and puts lots of salt and on his pizzas and uh, eats junk food, but he, he's going to protect everybody else. See, but I feel like that, especially with the whole like words thing, that just really First Amendment, I don't know, I feel like it's contradicting. I mean, that's the reason why the Constitution is in place, right? To protect us from that. Well, I don't think the founders were thinking about that. I think they were thinking about British rulers censoring our speech and telling us what religion to practice and quartering soldiers in our houses. But yeah, it's the same principle. So then what's the solution to the nanny state problem, to the fact that politicians are always trying to put us in a nanny state? The answer is to keep speaking about it and pointing out that they're wrong and voting them out of office. Yeah, that's a pretty good solution, I think. Um, so now on government spending about ridiculous things that is a waste of money or can be a waste of money. Um, they, they spend a lot on all levels, right? And they always say we need more and more and more spending because they say that that will improve the conditions of things that will improve everything. Um, you have covered a lot of ways in which the government has wasted money, taxpayer money. What are your three favorite? What are the three best examples of this, well, I mean, do you think? Are, there are so many. I mean, the biggest are Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. Well, let's just say Medicare and Social Security because... We older people are richer than you younger people, but this is a giant wealth transfer to people my age taking from young workers. And when Social Security was created, it was viewed as a special handout to people who lived unusually long. Most people didn't even live to age 65 at the time. So it was for the minority, but now most of us live much longer than that, and we rudely refuse to die. And now when I go to the doctor and I'm covered by Medicare, nobody even talks about the price of anything. You just go have the test. You never say, oh, well, is there a cheaper one somewhere? No one shops around. And in the next few years, this is going to bankrupt the country and steal just about all steal so much money, the government won't effectively be able to do the few good things it ought to do. Then you can also look at programs like farm subsidies. Cotton farmers and rice farmers, soy farmers get billions in checks from the government. And the argument from the politicians is we have to make sure we have an adequate and reliable food supply. But the argument's nonsense. We have an adequate hamburger supply and car supply and toothpaste supply without price supports. There are no price supports for most vegetables and fruits. We have plenty of them. It's just a scam. And once there is a government program, it, it never goes away. And so rich farmers get handouts. So sometimes examples such as these can fall under the category of pork barrel spending, right? Because it's what congressmen or, yeah, congressmen say 
they can say to basically everyone back home, back in their state that they are representing that that's what they're spending, right? Like they're like, oh, I'm bringing you this. I'm bringing you that. I'm bringing you cowboy poetry festivals. What are their what are their claims? Like, how do they justify all this spending? What do they tell people that it will do for them? I think you said it. They, they like telling the local people, look, I brought you this festival. And the money, it's all the other congressmen were grabbing stuff, and you're not going to reelect me if I don't grab my share. And while they may gain the local town something worth a million dollars, they only cost the rest of us a fraction of a penny. So we're not going to fight against that. Um, but earmarks and things like this, weren't they banned? Or at they least for a while, but yeah. And then they came back. I forget why. And frankly, they're not so terrible compared to the big programs like Medicare, farm subsidies, the war on drugs. So it's kind of, you know, it's wrong, but we ought to, we ought to get angry about the big stuff. I watched this segment that you did about a year ago, I think on a $2 million bathroom construction in New York City. And it $2 million for a single bathroom. It had, what, like, I think one stall and two urinals and two sinks. Why, why are these public projects so expensive? Because there's no competition. And when there's no competition, you can always think of a reason why you ought to wait till tomorrow to pour the cement or give somebody some extra sick days. Um, and it's not that the people are worse. At the beginning, you have people going into government who are all eager and want to do the right thing. But they have a million rules they have to follow because somebody building bathrooms stole the money once a hundred years ago a law was passed that says before you can spend the money you have to check with this group and get approval from that group and over the years all those permissions and steps grow what i found interesting about that video is that the when i said to the parks commissioner there's a much bigger nicer bathroom a few miles from you that was built for four hundred thousand dollars aren't you embarrassed he said well as a public project there are certain steps we need to do to make sure the public's involved we have to make sure we pay union wages and we have to make sure we check with all the community groups and let them help design the bathroom he just lived in government world and accepted this craziness and that's what happens to people who go to work in washington or state capitals so that's why the private sector kind of i don't know they make stuff for cheaper like bathrooms and it takes less time too yes that's that's wild then why doesn't why doesn't why isn't there more like outsourcing why don't they cut down on all the red tape and all the everything that gets in the way. What's their incentive? The red tape has been put there over hundreds of years. It would take enormous trouble, lawyers arguing to get rid of this. And hey, if you get rid of the rule that says you have to uh, check with the community board, then people might people might put in, you know, the, the white people in government might put in a bathroom that was offensive to the Latino people who live in that neighborhood. We better make sure we check. There's always an argument you can make for every one of those rules. Wow. Okay, moving on to bad laws that add to the homeless crisis. 
Last year, you did a segment on this in San Francisco. Um, what is the problem? Well, it's a complicated one. It's a many parter. My video focused on how you, you're not allowed to build anything in San Francisco. You can't get permission to build apartments because of all those rules. It takes so many years that people don't even try. But a lot of the so-called homeless uh, have homes, but they like being on the street where San Francisco gives them free stuff. So there's a danger in being kind and saying people need help because you teach people to be dependent. People start to feel like they're suckers if they don't get a handout when their neighbors do. And then some of those people are mentally ill. And it's a very tough decision. At what point do you say to someone who is a little crazy on the street, we're, you know, we, we want to help you. Well, I don't want help. Well, we're going to force you to get help. That's pretty much a violation of somebody's freedom. And it should only be done if the person is clearly a danger to other people and to themselves, says the law, though I'm not so sure about that one. People want to kill themselves. I think it should be their right. But that's a much tougher problem to handle because some of those people won't get help. And are you going to put them in a mental hospital against their will? Some should be. Interesting. What? I mean, so there's legislation that kind of controls the pricing in San Francisco. That is part of the reason why. So what is that legislation? About the pricing? I'm, I'm, I didn't follow. Like the way that, um, like legislation about like zoning and where you can live and all that stuff. Yeah, somebody lives in the neighborhood and they understandably say, we don't want a bunch of high rises in the neighborhood. This is a neighborhood of two story buildings and it's going to cast a shadow and the neighborhood is going to become too crowded, which is always a powerful argument until you think about how vibrant places like New York City and downtown San Francisco are because they have high buildings. But the people who get there first tend to say, we don't want newcomers here. I got mine. Now build someplace else. And then what about people? So what about the whole free stuff thing? How are, like, why are they just giving away free thing? Well, I guess it's not free. It's free to whoever is taking it, but they Why are they just giving right. stuff away? San Francisco's a rich city. We have so much. Tax the rich people. They have so much. These people have so little. Clearly, we can offer them food and a stipend of $100. I forget what they're paying them. It's, it was in my video. Um, because it just seems humane. I think maybe the most useful way to look at it is on a bigger scale. When I was graduating college, it was the beginning of the Great Society program. Uh, World War II had ended and we were looking for new problems to solve. And it was an outrage that in this rich country, some people were still poor. So government was going to fix that uh, with programs like uh, welfare and uh, literacy programs for poor people, et cetera, et cetera. And I was gung-ho. I thought that was great. And I did until I watched the results because all those handouts have unintended consequences. All laws have unintended consequences. And take just the welfare payments as an example. If you have a poor mother and she's got three children, you, you want her to have some health care for her children and some food stamps for food and maybe a voucher so she can afford a place to live. So you award that to poor people, but then you got to have a definition of what's poor. So you could say you can only earn X amount a year. And 
This one is for the most needy people, single mothers. So just those two have unintended side effects. The law that said it had to be a single mother meant that if the wo woman had a man in her life or a husband, he got out of there before the welfare worker arrived. And it was good if she had a man in her life. Uh, that improved the odds of the children succeeding. But this generous welfare state meant to help people encourage the man to leave. And then if there was, it's only for people who earn less than X, then the, the person has no incentive to earn X. And so they don't try to earn more money. And we teach dependency. And you can see this clearly if you look at a graph of the poverty rate in America, because when the war on poverty began, poverty rate dropped sharply for seven years. But since then, we've spent more than $20 trillion on these programs. But progress stopped because we taught people to be dependent. And then if you look at the graph from before the creation of the war on poverty, you see that Americans were lifting themselves out of poverty on their own. So this well-intended program spent trillions of taxpayers' money, made things better briefly, but made things worse for many more people for much longer. So it seems like it's just taking away the incentives to get better on your own. And as you said, creating dependency, which just, I don't know, I feel like that's just leading us to nowhere except more debt, which is not good. You got it. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to me. It's been such an honor. Um, yeah, go watch John's videos. They are very, very, I don't know, informative, entertaining. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoy talking to you, and I'm thankful to all the things early in my career that I learned from your mother.